And there were two other stories that made news in Delaware this week, and we will explore them now on State of Play. This week, we welcome Jan Ting, former GOP candidate for the Senate in 2006. Jan is a professor of law at the Temple University Beasley School of Law. Stephanie Hansen is a former Newcastle County president and now a member of the law firm of Young, Conaway, Stargett, and Taylor. Thank you both for joining us. Now, let me set up our first topic. Last month, state education officials froze $11 million in Race to the Top money earmarked for the Christina School District after the school board voted not to implement a reform plan, which would have resulted in 19 teachers being transferred. Now, last weekend, the board changed its mind. The district now has $11 million, but the teachers must go. Uh, did the school board make the right decision in, in literally changing its mind? In changing its mind, yes. They did not make the right decision in, uh, in, in holding up what essentially was the decision that led to holding up the $11 million to begin with. I mean, the whole point, the whole process around the race to the top money was our ability to promise that we were going to make bold reforms. And bold reforms means that somebody is not going to be happy when it's time to make the decisions. You just have to have the courage of your convictions when you get to that decision point. Um, good for them that they changed their mind, they reversed course, and they stuck to their convictions. I was going to say, Jan, it's a strong word, but do you, do you think the school district or school board was bullied by the state or the federal government in any way? Well, I think Stephanie knows elected and appointed officials have to do something when they're confronted with a problem, especially one involving children. Uh, they can't throw their hands up and say, let's do nothing. Uh, they needed to choose an option from those that were on the table, and they chose one. Everyone agreed, and uh, it's good that the uh, school board is on board. On the other hand, I can understand their second thoughts about it um, and uh, their concern that some of the better options were simply not on the table. Um, doing something about students' home life, well, that's not on the table. We can't do anything about that. Making teaching attractive for the best and brightest young people coming out of our schools and colleges, well, you know, what can we do about that? And so, like, the best options were not on the table. They had to choose from the options that were on the table. Everyone agreed on one, and so they're going to go with it. But you know what? I think a lot of people, myself concern, included, are concerned that this really isn't going to work in the end uh, and that we need to have even more bold and aggressive uh, tactics. We need to think about what makes teaching attractive for young people so they don't go into investment banking and so they don't come to my law school and become my students uh, instead of going into teaching. A lot of them, frankly, are former teachers teachers. Uh, they've tried teaching and they've said, you know what, it's not an attractive way uh, for a career. If we have other choices, we're going to take them. That's the big challenge for America. And, and you know, I, I really don't blame the school board for uh, having second thoughts about the deal that they entered into. And Jan, you mentioned uh, the teachers. Apparently, the teachers had a 20-minute interview essentially to save their job. Um, is that fair? Well, the paradox is that I, I think under all the, the things that are on the table, we end up holding teachers responsible, uh, and teachers sometimes are responsible, but they're also being held responsible for things that are beyond their control. I mean, students' home life, as we know, uh, is, is in crisis in many cases. You've got single parents out there worried about uh, uh, putting food on the table and providing a secure home environment, and so there are a lot of disruptive influences uh, in the lives of kids, and uh, it seems to a lot of people thinking about going into teaching uh, that, you know what, I don't want to be held responsible for that. Uh, that's beyond my control. I can go into law. I can be an investment banker and be held accountable for things that I really have control over. Why not do that? Uh, and speaking of control, who has it? Who has control of what is being taught in our local school district? Is it the, is it the school district, the officials there, or is it now uh, pretty much in the hands of the state government because they have the money? Do what we say or you're, we're taking our money back. Well, I, th I think that's a little harsh. I think it still is in the it's in the hands of the local school boards, and it's the, it's um it's in the hands of the teachers in the classroom. Although I think Jan is probably a whole lot better uh, prepared to answer such a question. What do you think, Jane? Well, yeah, I, I, I think there, there has, there's widespread uh, consensus about what ought to be happening in the classroom. The problem is, how do you make that happen in the classroom? Uh, and and I really think. Uh, 
the focus on teachers is correct. We have to have the right teachers in the classroom. And, and the paradox is, how do we do that? How do we attract the best people into teaching who have other choices and who don't have to be teachers? Uh, but, you know, how many Teach for America interns, you know, or do they do this two-year thing, how many of them go on and make careers in public school teaching? Uh, not too many, I would bet. Uh, and, and, and the problem is, when you start moving people around and transferring them and firing them for things that they don't feel really responsible for, that just sends a message out to, uh, to young people. Don't do this. Don't go into teaching because it's not rewarding, doesn't pay well, uh, you don't have any career security, you get yanked around by political forces and, uh, you know, go to law school like everybody else. Well, I can tell you right now, though, that there are a lot of, there are more applicants for teaching positions in the, in the school system than there are actual jobs jobs for them. You know, I I have I'm in the position of having a lot of children that are looking for jobs right now. Mm -hmm. My my husband and I there there are six. And I can tell you from their experiences and the experiences of their peers, for every one job opening that's available now in the school system, there are dozens of applicants for that one job. So we have the opportunity right. now to really choose but some good teachers. But the people that we want to apply are not the people that have no other choices. We want the people to apply who have plenty of other choices, and we want them to choose teaching because it's a rewarding, satisfying career. That's the real challenge. That's what needs to be right. on the table, and that's what we need it, to pick and, up. And, and how do we get the cream? of the crop teachers uh, into Delaware's classrooms and how do we keep them here? Because we all agree that, that that's the number one thing for our kids, give them the best teachers possible. Pay them more. Pay them more and empower them to, as, as a, a collegial body, uh, to have a say in what goes on in their schools. Uh, you know, I think we look at what happens at universities uh, and uh, faculty governance is a critical part of maintaining academic standards. Um, you have to give the faculty a role where they can make the decisions on behalf of the school, decide what's good teaching and what's not good teaching. Decide who's promoted uh, and who's not promoted and who's not tenured. Um, those are decisions that faculty make, and it makes people feel good about themselves. Wow, I've got a role in this. Is it, so is it fair to say that we're still working out the kinks of this uh, whole race to the top system, that, that Delaware really is kind of the guinea pig for the rest of the country? Yes, it's great. We got a uh, hundred and some million dollars, but uh, the process, uh, there's a few bumps in the road. Oh, I think so. And I think it's also important to make sure that we're giving the, the teachers that are coming up the resources that they need. I mean, here's, here's a great example. A, a friend of my family is a, graduated at the top of her class as a teacher, and she was going to teach biology and chemistry. She interviewed at two, well, at, at two particular schools in the state of Delaware. At one school she goes in, they show her the chemistry lab, or they show her the lab that she's going to be teaching in. Not a microscope, not a book, not, there are chairs, that's about it. And it's a it's a rundown lab. Right. She goes to the next school, and there are there are microscopes, there are books, there's there's a facility there that looks like we're ready, we're happy to, to to teach, we're happy to give you the resources you need to teach. Guess which one she went with? And they're very lucky to have her. But that's all part of giving the teachers the resources that they're going to need. If you want to attract good teachers and keep good teachers, you got to give them the tools that they need to stay good teachers. Can we compete with New Jersey, Maryland, and Pennsylvania to get? the best teachers. I think uh, we have some opportunities here in Delaware that don't exist in other states. Um, we are a small state, and so it's a lot easier to achieve political consensus, as we've done in, in Race to the Top. Uh, and, and I think, you know, there's a reason why Delaware got the money in the first round and, and, and other states didn't. I, I think we need to seize that advantage. Um, and. Um, you know, our, our problems simply because of the size of the state are smaller than uh, other states, and uh, we ought to be able to put some things on the table that are not on the table in other states. All right, uh, another big story this week. Delaware Republicans have elected John Sigler of Dover as chairman of the state party. The former NRA president replaces Tom Ross. All right, Stephanie, what do you know about uh, the new head of the Republican Party here in Delaware? Very little. I know very little. However, I think he does come from a type of background that, if any, is going to be able to, to I hate the word, use the word unite, but maybe that's the word to use, to unite the Republicans back to become a coherent party. I don't think that it's helpful for our state to have an, an incoherent Republican party. All right, All right Jane, here, they have a new slogan. Uh, together, a new beginning. Let's, let's break this down. Together, they weren't exactly united uh, during the primaries last fall. Uh, how does the, the Republican Party, of which uh, you were a prominent member of, uh, you know, 
at for one several point. years. Uh, yes. <laughs> how, how does the Republican Party get its act together? Well, they're a much smaller party uh, now than they were uh, in the past. And I think, uh, I agree with Stephanie, I think John Sigler is as good a leader as they're going to get. He's a very personable guy. I, I have met him, and he's a terrific fundraiser. Uh, and you don't get to be president of a national organization like the NRA by not knowing how to network. So he's got all the skills for uh, leading an organization and rejuvenating an organization. But the organization itself has become become a, a collection of single-issue social conservatives who are, I, in, to my mind, kind of masquerading as economic conservatives. I mean, the, the real core concerns are guns, anti-abortion, blocking uh, gay marriage rights, uh, and, and issues like that. And the big problem is not John Sigler. Uh, the big problem is Christine O'Donnell, uh, that uh, she's out there, she's going to run again, she's got a ton of money, she knows how to raise money now, and when she is at the top of the ticket, um, people turn out to vote against her. Uh, I mean, Democrats and independents right. uh, rally against her, and that has ripple effects down the whole ballot. Right. Uh, it, it is not a coincidence that uh, Democrats <coughs> in, a, in a Republican year made gains uh, in 2010 if, because of who was at the head of the uh, Republican If there ballot. was no Christine O'Donnell, that's a, that's a huge if, but uh, we, we're probably not having this discussion because uh, Castle's probably you know, in Washington right now, and we're, you know, we're not worried about the future of the Republican Party. It seems to be on, on fairly good ground. But uh, the fact that she came in and created all this turmoil, let, let's talk about the second part of their slogan, a new beginning. What do they have to do now to uh, get back on track? They need to come up with a coherent uh, Republican mission statement, I think. As I think, like, like Jan had said, there are, the, there are the social conservative Republicans and there are the fiscal conservative Republicans. And uh, somewhere in the middle, these folks have to have some sort of, of coherency where they can work together. Um, I'm just going to be, I hope that it works. I think they have more coherency now that they've essentially driven the moderates from the party. Uh, you know, with the defeat of Mike Castle, I think a lot of moderates uh, have come to the conclusion there really isn't a place for them in the Delaware Republican Party. And that, ironically, leads to coherence within the Republican Party that, oh, now they, they can get their act together. The problem is um, you can't win statewide. Uh, they can they can win in, in isolated districts mm -hmm. uh, around the state, but they can't win statewide, and that's a problem. And as long as Christine is around, she's going to be around for at least the next four years. She's going to run uh, against Carper uh, next year. They're, she's going to run against Coons again uh, in uh, 2014 because he's only got a four-year term. Uh, so she's going to be around for a while. Well, the Republican Party obviously needs some candidates, so let me put both of you on the spot. Give me a couple of names. Who are some... Some rising stars in the Republican Party. Uh, Jan, go ahead. Well, Greg Lavelle, uh, my state representative in the 11th Rep District, was just elected the vice mm -hmm. chairman uh, of the Republican Party. And uh, I know Greg well. I, th I respect him. I think he is uh, certainly one of the rising stars. And, but I, I will say, I think the Democrats have done a much better job of, uh, of grooming a junior varsity. Uh, they've got a, a set of reserves out there who are ready and willing to run statewide at the drop of a hat. And and uh, I must say the Republicans have not done such a good job. And, and you don't have a long list of Republicans like Greg Lavelle who are ready to step right. in and run statewide. Quickly, Stephanie, any names warm come up, to mind? Warm-up name for that would be uh, Tom Kovac. I mean, he's, you know, he's now president mm -hmm. of Newcastle County Council. So, and he's done, I mean, he's been in the news a lot. And I think he's got a lot of popular support behind him. In the farm him. system. Thank you, Stephanie Hansen and Jan Ting. By the way, Jan is a contributor to Newsworks.org with his blog, Brandywine to Broad. Check it out.